This one is a bit more thinking about the next 18 years. Um, so the three things that I sort of want to go into more broadly around when we're thinking about what it would take to not, and I think here thinking about Phil's presentation is really good, not only what it would take to form a Greens government, but what would it take to have a Greens government that was successful? Because I think one of the thing, really important things to think about, and I'll go into it a little bit uh, in the, uh, later in the presentation, is there has been moments before in the last 20 to 30 years where, uh, for a lack of a better term, radical left governments have been elected and they have immediately, over the no forced course of the next year, been forced to essentially implement a lot of the neoliberal policies that they were elected on uh, the basis of opposing. Uh, and so a big question for us is not just how we get to that point where we form a Greens government, but how do we get to the point where we do build alliances in the social movements, in community organisations, and trade unions, uh, where we're help able to build the sort of power that, exerted, that can be exerted not just in the workplace, but in the ballot box and in parliament and in our communities. So what that looks like, I'm going to argue there's three major things that we need to think about. One, over the next 18 years, there's going to be some massive demographic and political economy shifts that are already happening right now that make it enormously possible that we could achieve something like this. The second big thing is we know what it takes to win seats. And so we know what it takes, we know what it would take, if we really think about it, to win a bunch of seats. <laughs> a lot of seats. And then finally, talking a bit about what Phil and Amy touched on around building power in the community. So you've probably heard a bit about this, but one thing to think about sort of going through the way politics is going, and Phil mentioned the decline of trade union membership in tandem with the decline of trade union membership and the hollowing out of civil society organisations has been the decline of the traditional modes of politics that we've seen in Australia, as well as actually across the world, where there's a dominant conservative party and a, a dominant, for lack of a term, either liberal or social democratic, or in this case, Labor Party. And what you can see since about the 1990s, there has been a secular decline uh, in the Labor vote. And at the same time, this isn't Greens, it's just the colour's gone weird. But a rise in the third party vote. A lot of that, a bit of that has been in the Greens, but it's been others as well. And for us, this presents both opportunities and risks. What's occurring in the political system is more and more people are being cut free of their traditional ties to either the Conservative, or in this case, Liberal National Party, or the Labor Party. And for those who've gone door knocking, you experience that in a very direct material sense when you ask people, what do you think about politics? And they think, oh mate, it's shit, I don't really pay attention. So it, is, it manifests as either disengagement, distrust, or what we sometimes call anti-politics. And then there's demographics. And this is a bit small, so I can read it out for people. But this is just some analysis of the 2019 election. So in the one end, we've got the sort of political system disintegrating and going through a long form of crisis without any resolution. There hasn't been an emergence, for instance, of a political force that takes all of that disorganized energy in society and organizes it into a big political movement. Hopefully that's where we come in. But what we do know right now, there is two pretty interesting things happening. Young people are emerging as an enormous base for the Greens. Now this might sound obvious, but it's worth thinking about the fact that in the 1980s, Thatcher won over, so a conservative prime minister in the UK, and this is a similar process in Australia, won overwhelmingly young people's votes. They beat the Labor Party in terms of winning young people's votes. But right now in Australia, in the 2019 federal election, the Greens, if only 18 to 24 year olds voted, would have won 37% of the national vote, which is really pretty amazing to think about. But here is where we get a bit of a clue about why that's happening. Because if only renters voted, in the federal election, the Greens would have got 20% of the vote. And what we need to start, the question we need to ask if we want to think about how we can win and how we can form a Greens government is why are these two things happening? They're the two biggest determinants. If you want to think about a Greens voter or a progressive voter, they're either young or they're a renter. And that's about it. So why is that happening? Well, at the same time, and in fact, I haven't put this on, but if you map the rise of the Greens vote from about when the Greens emerged in the 90s to here, it occurs remarkably, the rate of increase occurs remarkably in line with the increase in renters. 
while at the same time we've seen a substantial decrease in people who own their home without a mortgage. To the point, actually, if you follow those trends, there's a crossover in about a couple of years, so we should see it in the next few years. This has never happened before in Australian history, that there would end up being more renters in Australian society than homeowners. And the question we have to ask ourselves is, well, why are renters more progressive or radical or want to see the system change more than homeowners? And actually, this quickly on this, and this is sort of the first answer to that question. Something changed in the way our economies function in Western democracies in particular in about the 1990s. People call it neoliberalism. But what occurred was the defeat in large scale of a lot of organised labour. Phil mentioned the decline in trade union membership. And a change in the way our economies work and the way people accumulated wealth. And what happened was this green line is dwelling prices. So housing prices, that's average full-time earnings indexed against the 1970s. Never again, once again, never before has this occurred, such a massive divergence between dwelling prices and earnings. And this is where you start to get a bit of an idea of what's going on. Because we have a way that our economic system functions. And what it says is if you own an ha asset, whether it be a home or anything like that, that is how we're going to improve your material life. That's how you're going to make gains. Your asset price is going to increase. You can borrow against the value of that asset. Or if you're lucky enough to own a few homes, then you're going to do pretty well, regardless of whether or not your wage increases. But for renters, the economic system is really badly broken. And for everyone here, actually, put, a, put your hands up if you're a renter out of interest. <laughs> Interesting. <laughs> I'm not trying to shame the homeowners here, by the way. I know really a lot of, uh, some of my best friends are homeowners. <laughs> um, but here's where it gets really interesting, because since about the GFC, which is this big line here, young people in particular have really been screwed. In fact, for 25 to 34 year olds and 15 to 24 year olds, their wages right now are lower than they were in 2008. That's really full on, if you actually think about what, how people would experience that materially. So what we've got is a situation where, if you go back and think about it, this, this structural shifts in the economy aren't reversing. If we follow actual trends, there's going to be a growing and larger section of the population who have no material interest in the current way that our economic and political system works. In fact, I haven't got it here, but it, the Scanlon Foundation asked people in Queensland in particular, what do you think should happen to the political system? This is the 2019 Scanlon Foundation. And lots of questions like slight change, mild change, no change, complete overhaul. 49% of Queenslanders, one in two Queenslanders said complete overhaul, which, you know, that's why I love Queensland. This has also led amongst 25 to 29 year olds. In the 1950s and the 1960s, you could pretty much bet that close to one in two people between the ages of 20, 25 and 29 would own their own home. This has substantially decreased now where it's fallen below 40% again for the first time in Australian history if you go back the other way. And so hopefully I'm painting a picture for you that there's some structural shifts going on that really has starting to shift the way the electorate thinks and the way people in Australian society think about politics and economics. And this only advan advantages us and progressive politics because we're speaking to a broader, broader range of people who not only want to vote for the Greens and get involved uh, in radical politics, but also are here tonight and are by and large the people that volunteer and get involved in our political movements. Now the second big thing that's going on is you would think with the election of the Morrison government in 2019 and the rise of One Nation and a variety of other sort of the rise of the far right that actually the Australian politics and sorry Australian society is getting more conservative. But actually it's the complete opposite. It's really weird to think about. This is from the um, a, question that was asked of everyone voting in the 2019 Australian election. They asked, does big business in this country have too much power? 72% of people, so 72% of people of everyone who voted in the Australian election said, yeah, big business has too much power. And then turned around and voted for Morrison and One Nation. Now, it can be hard to grapple with that until you start to think about the fact that people right now don't think the political system, regardless of who they vote for, will deliver anything for them anyway because they've experienced Labor governments before at a state and federal level. 
They've experienced those things and nothing has changed. You saw this, the decline in wages while that occurred for young people. You saw the increase in renters and more and more people being locked out of the way our economic system delivers wealth, which is via asset ownership. People also asked in 2015 what you thought, who privatisation benefited. Even literally about 5% of even Liberal voters thought that the general public benefited from privatisation. Um, so we're getting a situation here, right, where you can start to think about it. You've got the Labor Party and the Liberal Party, the two dominant parties in politics, on lockstep on things like privatisation and lockstep on cut the, every cut to the corporate tax rate, by the way, that's occurred over the last 20 years has been bipartisan. And so why would you engage with politics? So those are the conditions under which we're campaigning. And we figured this out, and in 2016 there was a big shift in the way that we campaigned and when we, when we went to people's doors, and it started with Johnny C's, uh, Johnny C's Gabba 16 campaign. Now these uh, numbers might be a bit small, so I'll just tell you what you're looking at. Here is the way we measure our campaign capacity, which for those that don't know, it's called meaningful conversations. How many conversations can a ca in a campaign can we have one-on-one -on -one with people, and how many votes does that shift? And when we started the Gabba 16 campaign, we were told, looking at sort of radical organising, political organising and election campaigns, that about one in three conversations changes a vote. And we thought, oh, OK. Well, we went out and got 2,500 conversations in the Gabba ward, and we won 3,500 votes. So rather than one in three, it was actually 137%. We did it again in 2017, adopting that same strategy of relating to people around the fact that politics was shit, that we have a radical redistributive program. We actually went to the 2017 state campaign. One of our policies was also proposing four new public holidays, talking about public holidays, big taxes on mining corporations, a really transformative program. And when we delivered people face to face in conversations, 65% of people ended up voting for the Greens out of those conversations. Take it again into Griffith 2019, we had 10 and a half thousand conversations, we won 8,000 votes. GABA 2020, we had 2,500 conversations, we won an extra 2,500 votes. You're starting to get the picture. Now in South Brisbane actually it was interesting, the closest we got to one in three, which is still remarkable, and I'll tell you why, why that's important actually when I go into the next slide. We had 9,500 conversations, we won 3,000 votes. There's a, a lot of enjoyment going on. <laughs> Clearly upset about the fact that we only got 32% <laughs> of those. <laughs> votes and you get an average of 83 percent so when we play in campaigns we get pretty conservative but what's remarkable about this just think about that for a second politics shouldn't work like that people are loyal to political parties they make their decisions based on historical and family connections who where they work for but actually what happens when we reach people nah they end most by and large they'll end up voting for us that is the situation that we find ourselves in, and it's historically unprecedented. 50 years ago, if we were door knocking and we did that, we would not be getting these numbers because people are becoming disconnected from the way, traditional ways that our Australian political system works. So we can't, having said all of that, we can't just put our feet up and then, you know, in 18 years' time, wake up and there's a Greens government with a really transformative trade union movement and, you know, incredible transformations in Australian society without lifting a finger. We do make our own history, but not in the circumstances of our choosing. It just so happens that the circumstances are quite good for us. Funny thinking about that, really. And so, what would it look, Parliament, federal parliament, look like if, just say, from the 2019 results, all of a sudden the Greens became... Uh, the majority partner in a Labor Greens, for instance, coalition. Well, we would need to win an extra 44 federal seats. So what we did, which is a bit wild, is we, when we're planning a campaign, so for Griffith, for instance, we look at the margin between us and Labor, and we say, how many conversations do we have to have in the community to overcome that margin? Well, we looked at all 152 seats in Australian Parliament, and then we said, we ordered them, we got all the information we needed around primary votes in the 2019 election, two-party preferreds if the, if the Liberal Party had won. And we said, what are our best target 45 seats? Uh, well, 44 on top of Melbourne. Uh, and how many meaningful conversations would we need to have to win all 44 of those seats? And what was really interesting is in terms of net change, we'd end up winning about 20 seats off the LNP and 24 off the Labor Party. Pretty much denying the LNP uh, a majority ever again. Okay, not ever again. It sounds scary. And so we made three assumptions, two assumptions, sorry, when we were planning this um, fantasy campaign for 18 years of government. 18 years of government. Government in 18 years. Although after that, um, 
The first one was you thought saw before that actually it's 84% is our ratio when we have conversations. We got super conservative and we said, no, stick to it. One in three conversations wins the vote. Even though this is ignoring, by the way, all of the shifts in the number of renters that will increase over the next 18 years, all of the shifts in the economy and wages and asset ownership that actually mean that we'll probably see a general increase in the progressive nature of the election, people voting Greens. We ignored all that. And we also said, we know this from the South Brisbane campaign, an average volunteer will end up having 80 conversations over the course of a campaign. So then we went a little crazy. <laughs> That's how many conversations it would take to form government. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Down to the number. <laughs> uh, that's 1.8 million conversations, which to which a reasonable person would say, that seems pretty easy. That is 23,000 volunteers across the country. Yeah, <laughs> who wants to sign up for the 2040 campaign? Um, so that's a lot of volunteers. But then we have to think about breaking it down because that's over the course of the next 18 years, right? So we went a little bit crazy and we mapped out every election between the next one and to 2040. And then we worked out how you would go about rolling out this plan over the next 18 years, assuming that the bulk of your, our meaningful conversations and our capacity would occur in the last few, 2037, when, you know, there's real Mad Max hours in terms of climate change, but <laughs> Mad Max in a negative sense. And things are getting pretty cool. <laughs> you can see, and what's really interesting about this to think about is that by about this, this in terms of capacity increase, Compared it to the capacity increase that's occurred since 2016, there has been a 12 times capacity increase between 2016 and now in our capacity just in Queensland to have meaningful conversations. That's how substantial there has been an increase. We're relying on a much smaller increase over this next 18 years. Uh, so, if, for instance, if we went and got our target in Griffith, which is 32,000 conversations just in here alone in this next election, and we won Griffith, we would be on our target for 2022. But think about just the way capacity has grown here and map that across the whole country. If we really, if things started to change, if we got those first victories and think about what happens when we won the GAB award. Think about what would happen if we won another federal seat. That hasn't happened in 10 years. And the enthusiasm and the number of people that come to our movement because we've won. Because people back winners, but also people feel helpless and don't feel like they have a direction or a strategy that can actually change anything. In fact, they feel like they're just an isolated individual and they can't change anything. And often we give these sort of presentations in much smaller ways to people in the Griffith campaign or any campaign we're running to prove that your individual action, even if it is just 80 conversations, can end up changing history. And again, this is ignoring a few tipping points, that uh, crazy chart that I just showed you before. When we win seats, and when we win progressive reform, something really important happens. Who can guess, by the way, I'll take a couple of answers, the major barrier to voting Greens in Australia right now. So this is about, there's about 33% of people in Australia right now who thought about voting Greens. Who can guess that what the vast majority of people say, oh, that's why I didn't end up voting Greens. Any guesses? Oh, well, you are very, over here we've got some actual Green staffers. So. <laughs> cheating over there but it is they can't win so many conversations we have when we go to the door they say oh, i'm thinking about voting greens but you know you guys can't win then we say we can win and they say oh i'll vote greens but think about when we get those first few wins on the board it creates a sense of momentum and it shifts people over and there's a good argument to be made which we've seen in european countries that once greens parties or left far left parties get to that point of about looking like they're on the verge of something there's a huge extra shift. You've seen this with the German Greens, actually, where they're now the leading party in terms of polling. They're on track to win the next uh, German federal elections. What we also haven't factored in is that there may well be an accelerated collapse, in particular in the Labor Party, and <laughs> a small thing, climate change. And these are all major tipping points we've ignored. We've just said brute force. How do you go and form government? But obviously that isn't enough. This is the final section. So before I mention that there's governments that have been elected uh, where on platforms probably more progressive than ours, they form national governments and within about a year they've ended up capitulating. One that often is talked about uh, is the Mitterrand government in France in the 1980s. 
elected on a transformative progressive platform, was going to nationalise large sections of industry, give workers a whole bunch of new power, I think reduce the working week. Within about a year, he started implementing what France now calls their work first wave of neoliberalisation. And that was because as a political party and as a president, he had become isolated from general civil society in France. There wasn't the organisation that Phil had just laid out really well in the trade union movements. And there wasn't those connections between a progressive mass-based party and the workers' movement and communities. And so what I wanted to do was take three examples of um, things that we want to do and explain why it can't just be that we have Amy as Premier in Queensland, um, Michael Berkman as Treasurer and a majority Greens government in Queensland. <laughs> Although that would be pretty, pretty good. Um, so the first thing to think about when we're building public housing, a mass build of public housing where we get to Vienna levels of public housing where, you know, 60% of people will live in some form of social housing, beautifully designed, lifetime right to the home, rents capped at 25%. All of a sudden, we can start to think about one pretty major barrier to that, which is that the way our economy functions, the way banks and property developers make enormous amounts of money, is private development. And so all of a sudden, we've got an opposition to that. We also have the opposition that often when public housing is built in a community, people don't want it. And so, and then finally, the Greens and progressive governments sometimes don't have fantastic relationships with construction unions. And you can see what would happen if, for instance, we just went about and said, OK, we've won, we're going to build 100,000 public homes. And over the course of two protracted, bitter years of fighting with both communities and construction unions and banks and property developers, we end up losing the next election and it doesn't really matter anyway. And so there's three major things that our, as a, we have to think about as a political party if we're going to build the sort of movement that would take to do the, engage in these sort of progressive changes is... How do we change and turn into a mass-based party capable of winning those fights in society as well as in politics? And the first one is winning consent. We talk about our massive field campaigns and our capacity to go and talk to people. But one way to imagine this is if, we're, if Amy has just announced this program, at the same time the Greens are deploying thousands of volunteers across the areas where we, in inner city areas in particular, where we know public housing is going to be built, to go and talk to those neighbourhoods and engage in democratic consultation, say, what would you like out of this public housing? Uh, what, do you, what are your worries? What are your fears? And this is how we might be able to change it. Because we know that often state and federal governments are really trash and councils are trash at consultation, so we take it into our own hands to do it. The second thing is when... Uh, we do build this public housing, often people become isolated from those local communities. So do we have a political party capable of going and grabbing those people and saying, hey, come to these community events, have these welcome day events, uh, come and meet your neighbours, come to a um, uh, you know, community soccer match or a potluck dinner or whatever it may be, but organised on a mass scale across all of Queensland or Australian society where we're welcoming people into these new public homes. And finally... If the property developers and the banks are going to get really upset about this, we need to be able to develop the sort of relationships that Phil was talking about with the QTU, with construction unions. This has already started happening, actually. Uh, there was a large section of CFMEU construction union members at the latest development rally that Amy and Jono organised, where we can get to a point where uh, construction workers say, well, no, we want to build public housing because at least we can afford to live in it, not the luxury apartments that you're making us build at the moment. So that's winning public housing. Oh, who likes this? Can you, everyone read that? <laughs> it says Queensland Greens no surrender four day week and a three day bender. Not that I'm necessarily endorsing that all the time. Um, <laughs> but what would it take to win a four day work week? Reductions in the working week have never just been legislated in parliament. In fact, every time they've been won, they've been won by powerful unions. In fact, the first reduction major five-day working week was won in Australia by the... I can't remember now, they're actually... Stonemasons, thank you. All across the world. Uh, and so when you th think about it, implementing something like that would require the sort of uh, radical trade unions. For instance, the QTU, which has a lot to gain from a reduction in the working week. Uh, what would it look like if we thought about we want to implement a four-day work week uh, and um, uh, we advise our un union allies in, in advance that we want to do this, but we're going to need you to get out and fight for it over the next few years and we'll back you up from government. And so 
would it look like a mass political party in the Greens going and, and leveraging their connections to the QTU via members who happen to also be members of the Greens, pushing on log of claims, so log of claims are what the unions uh, developed prior to industrial bargaining to include a reduction in the working week. And when they're going about fighting for those things, one uh, thing that parties have done in the past, in particular the German Social Democrats in the early 20th century, the Italian Communist Party post-World War II, was build large-scale community support networks. So providing large places where workers can go and get free food, where they can go and learn about basic things from literacy all the way up to political theory and things like that. Are we running free breakfasts and free lunches in areas where workers are fighting for the reduction of the working week to back them up and ensure that as a community we've got their back? And finally, taxing billionaires. You probably can't see this, but this was on election night, budget night, sorry, the other night. Every single one of these people are some of the... Uh, so this is CEO of Seven West, Ryan Stokes. He's worth about $10 billion. This is Ross Packer of the Packer family, a net worth of $6 billion. And this is James Simmons, who is a real estate mogul, whose net worth is $724 million. All of them were on budget night, getting minute, uh, invited there by the government to celebrate the budget being introduced, if you're wondering who the ruling class in Australia are. But these people are very powerful. And who remembers even at a basic time in the 2000 and, around 2008, 2009, when Kevin Rudd, of all people, tried to implement a mining tax? The mining corporations turned on an aggressive wave of advertising. Internally, there was pressure applied internally with the Labor Party, where um, factional members connected to the mining industry uh, were rather unhappy that the person that they thought they were in control of was running off and trying to implement a mining tax. And you say what you will about Kevin Rudd, but in the end, he ended up being removed rather than being allowed to implement something as basic as just a very simple tax on the mining industry. And so very quickly, we would need to be able to have the capacity, if we really did want to propose taxing the mining industry or taxing billionaires, to run the sort of field campaigns that we can run in elections outside of election periods as well. If the corporate media are talking about how terrible this is going to destroy the country, we need to be able to have a million conversations across the country telling people why that's a lie and actually this will improve your life. We need to be able to... Uh, build those alliances again with trade union movements and community organisations so conversations are not just happening on the streets and at the doors, but they're happening in workplaces about why actually the company that you work for should probably be paying a bit more tax. And actually, I'm going to start putting pressure on that company to start paying a little bit more tax as well. So just to finish, what, that, what would that require in terms of transforming both the Australian Greens and also just the way we engage in politics? The first big one is political education and training. This is actually a political training we ran in the Griffith campaign of, about a month ago. Not only trainings, though, where we teach people how to have persuasive conversations, but we teach people how to organise in their communities. We teach people about political theory, how to be community organisers, how not only to change people's minds to vote for the Greens, but how to convince people to join a union or how to convince people uh, to uh, get angry about their material circumstances and have some hope for the future. This is actually when the um, Queensland Greens MPs offices ran an iftar dinner. Um, for local Muslim community. But we also need to be able to become a community organising and social, uh, a, a social party in the sense that we engage in social activities powerhouse. So as we win more seats with Amy one now and as we win uh, more federal seats, what we gain is more staffers and more capacity and volunteers to engage in community organising, whether that be helping to run free breakfasts or free lunches at local schools, whether that be helping to run housing campaigns. Adam Bant's office has won a series of major improvements in the public housing in his area just by helping to organise public housing tenants. But imagine that at scale where we have a permanent community organising arm of the Australian Greens who also engages with the trade union movement and helps organise trade union members within the Australian Greens to push for some of the progressive reforms that we want to win. And finally, underpinned by universalist politics. I'm not sure you can recognise this photo. This is Donald Trump. This is Scott Morrison. But believe it or not, it's not the Governor General standing between them. It's Gina Reinhart. <laughs> and what I mean by universalist politics isn't a politics that... Um, flattens the differences in our society. It actually celebrates them. It says that all of the differences in our society are positive things that we should encourage diversity and multiculturalism, but finds a common thread, a common humanity that cuts across that and says that actually we all have more in common 
uh, with, say, a refugee on Manus and Nauru than we do with these losers. And whenever we're able to capture that politics where we say, actually, everyone deserves a good home, everyone deserves a quality education, everyone deserves a four-day work week with a well-paying job and time to spend time with your family and friends, regardless of whether or not you're from, say, Afghanistan or from Western Sydney. Everyone deserves that if you come to Australia. And that universalist politics we've taken to the last few elections, and it's something that will continue to change, but it's defined in opposition to these people. Because so often in our politics and our society, these people encourage us to find other enemies, whether it be people of different coloured skin, different accents, uh, come from certain countries, because they want to distract from the fact that they're the ones in power right now. So you're probably thinking, this is a bit crazy. Um, and fair enough, I also think it's a bit crazy. Um, but I wanted to show a very cute photo. You might be able to see it. I look like a baby. This is Jono. This is one of our first door knocks in the 2016 campaign. Now, talking about the increase in capacity. I'll see if anyone's actually, anyone else is here. There's Mark. Hello, we have Mark. He looks much younger back then. <laughs> oh, I made it an age in a good way. Um, <laughs> I didn't mean to do that, Mark. I'm sorry. <laughs> And this, we thought this was really big, by the way. We were like, oh, yeah, we're going to win. And we did actually win. But this is the first door knock uh, for the Griffith campaign. And I talked about increasing capacity. The, the rate of increase in growth that is occurring at the moment in our political movement here in Queensland, but all across Australia, is unprecedented. It really is unprecedented. And just to finish... I talked about before that if we just won Griffith, that's the size of that campaign and what we're going to be able to achieve, uh, uh, what we've achieved over the last five years. This is how small the swing is, just that we just need to win Griffith. That's the increase in our vote since 2013 when we've been properly campaigning. We only need 3,500 votes and we aim to have 32,000 conversations. But Amy mentioned it before, uh, and uh, Phil mentioned with regards to engaging the trade union movement, this isn't going to happen on its own. All we've got is the opportunity. All we've got the opportunity is, all the opportunity we have right now in particular isn't just that young 18-year plan. My favourite story, you're probably not sure if you've heard this one, Adam Bant tells it, which I love, um, which is that on the night of the 2010 election, or the morning after, sorry, Adam was very hungover and he woke up and he had two missed... Um, missed calls on his phone and he didn't recognise the numbers so he played the messages and he had just woke up in 2010 finding out that actually either the Labour or Liberal Party would need his support to form government and the first message was from uh, Tony Abbott <laughs> vying for his support and he was like oh this is Tony good hey Adam yeah hope you're doing all right I just wanted to let you know I've always really cared about the uh, environment <laughs> and it just think about that power that we could win because the, how tight Australian Parliament is right now that if we do win Griffith and we do win one or two other seats around the country, we could wake up in the morning and I could have a message from Scott Morrison going on about how much he's always loved um, the environment. <laughs> Checks notes. But what I've said and what we've said before is if we were to win that and what I hope tonight proves is that wouldn't be the end of something. It would be the beginning of something because we've happened upon something that so rarely happens in politics and organising, a strategy that wins. And by God, do we need to start winning as quickly as possible. And so if everyone here, for instance, just went out and knocked on, did, knocked on a door, did a one session of door knocking every fortnight for the next 12 months, we'd hit our targets. We'd get more meaningful conversations than any campaign in Australian political history has got. Just if everyone in this room did a fort every fortnight or dropped off a letter or anything like that. So what I would encourage you to think about is how we can get to those 32,000 conversations. How you can get involved in trade union movements. If you are a trade union member, please reach out to Phil. And think about the fact that when you knock on those doors, we're not just thinking about winning a seat. We're thinking about and devising and helping to build, all, with all of you here collectively, a strategy that can fundamentally transform the politics and the economy and society in this country. Where when you go out door knocking, you'll meet a lot of people for whom this isn't 
a game. This is their life. Conversations you'll have with people about being plunged back into poverty or being kicked out of their public housing or not having enough money and having to choose between paying the rent or feeding their kids. That's happening right now and that's the stakes of our politics. It isn't just climate change, it's terrible inequality that destroys people's lives right now. But we can change it. We really can. And when you do have those conversations and you think, oh, I just changed someone's vote or I just convinced them to get involved and you think, what if we had 1.8 million of those? <laughs> what if I convinced 23,000 of my closest friends to get involved? <laughs> That's the stakes. That's what I think we can achieve. I hope you got something out of that tonight and thanks everyone for coming.